Jeremy Black is a retired historian who has written over 140 books. He specializes in politics, British politics, in the 18th century, but he covers many subjects, one of which is slavery. Now, slavery is very much in the news at the moment. Black Lives Matter around the world, statues being torn down, white guilt, all sorts of issues to do with the woke agenda and to do with political correctness that stem from that original slave trade. But Jeremy Black has written a terrific article in this month's Quadrant magazine arguing that the British Navy does not get the credit it deserves for ending slavery. Welcome to Outsiders, Jeremy Black. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Very pleased to be on the programme. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming on. Terrific article in Quadrant. Now, tell us basically your theories about the British Navy and about the extraordinary role they played in ending slavery and fighting slavery. Well, what I've argued in Quadrant and what I've argued in a number of books on the empire, and remember, Australia was a leading partner in the empire in the late 19th and 20th century. What I've argued is that like any empire, exactly as you'd expect, there are things that you might won't be happy about with the benefit of hindsight, but there are also things that we play down the value of. Now, the most important thing for our predecessors' generation was the enormous role that the British and the Australians and the Canadians played in stopping German and Japanese tyranny. But if you go back to the 19th century, the British Navy, the Navy that had defeated Napoleon, spends a lot of its time in the decades from the 18-teens onwards fighting slavers, principally in Atlantic waters, but also in Indian Ocean waters and nearer Australia in waters off Borneo and also waters off China. And of course, it's absolutely typical at the moment with everybody knocking empire that everybody emphasizes the bad part but doesn't discuss the more positive aspects that we could look at. So, Jeremy, explain how the British Navy came to be involved in stopping. You tell some uh, rollicking tales of uh, various boats, battles, uh, small crews taking on much larger uh, boats, freeing slaves, taking them to a uh, free town. Uh, tell us how the British government, the parliament, firstly got the Navy involved in that process, and then how the, how the Navy reacted to, the, I guess, their new orders? Well, uh, Britain took the view that having banned the slave trade itself, it was because they thought it was a bad thing. They were going to try and stop everybody else doing it. What they essentially did was negotiate treaties with other governments and then enforce them. So, for example, you, you take a government like Brazil. Brazil had banned the slave trade. It's just the Brazilians did bugger all about it. Um, British warships spent a lot of their time from the 18-teens onwards, um, off Africa in particular, attacking and stopping slavers. So what they would try and do is, as you've said, stop the slave ships, they'd try and take off uh, the slaves, and they would then take the slave ship over and generally um, take it to a harbour and have it sequestered. Now... This involved a hell of a lot of fighting. The people that the slavers were quite prepared to kill for their own ends, not surprisingly so. It was a very profitable trade. Um, so you have pitched battles at sea um, from the 18 teens onwards, principally in Atlantic waters, but by the sort of 1870s, 1880s, increasingly in the Indian Ocean as well. And that's because the slave trade went on being a major factor. I mean, people today tend to think of the slave trade as something that Europeans did, but it's worth bearing in mind that slavery was widespread across the world into the late 19th century, and there were many slavers. There were slavers who were Arabs off the uh, in the Indian Ocean. You've got uh, slavers off Borneo who are local people there. Um, so slavery is quite a widespread practice, and therefore the Navy, based on a whole host of naval positions, and a lot of the naval officers weren't particularly happy about being stuck in the tropics. It was deadly. They were <laughs> fighting yellow fever and malaria as much as they were fighting the, uh, the slavers. And casualty rates were quite high, but this was expected. It was a job of the Navy. And between 1815 and 1854, when the Crimean War started, and you'll remember if you're in Australia, that's why there was a fort built um, 
yeah, off Sydney in order to, because they were worried the Russian ships would come down there. And then from 1856 onwards, Britain was not at war uh, with any other Western power, and therefore its navy could give a certain amount of particularly smaller ships, because what you want, you don't want your deep draft big uh, ships of the line. You need smaller ships which are able to go into coastal waters and chase the slavers who generally were quite shallow draft ships. So as you correctly say, what this means is relatively small ships, British ships, often with a relatively small number of cannon, are fighting it out against the slavers who often are quite well armed. Uh, Jeremy, I'm fascinated as well. You mentioned the Arab slavers. There's this idea that uh, slavery was white people against black people, and certainly there was plenty of that. But you mention Italian slaves. You mention uh, the fact that uh, the, what, 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 you just, what Lord uh, Viscount Palmerston described as the evil that actually occurs in Africa, the Razia, I believe they're called, which is the, the raids by Africans within Africa. So uh, it, tell us about, the, I guess, the racial component of those involved in the slave trade. Right. Well, I've done three books on slavery, so let me just be very brief, because you've only got so much time to listen to me. There are two main components of slavery in world history. There's private slavery and there's state slavery. So state slavery is when you work for an enforced work for a government. You know, you're a prisoner, you're somebody seized from a foreign country. So that's how, for example, classical powers like Rome got the galleys to work. You could argue that that's how uh, labor was conducted in the Soviet gulags. You could argue that the government of North Korea at the moment is running a slave society. So that's state slavery. Then on top of that, you have what we tend to think of slavery, which is private slavery, when you're working uh, as a slave for a private individual or a corporation. That was very widespread in world history until the 19th century. Coercive labor systems, some of them we call slavery, some of them we call serfdom, some of them we call prison labor, but coercive labor systems were very, very common. As you say, the dominant one in the Atlantic was, in the Atlantic world was European uh, uh, controlled. But the dominant one within Africa itself was obviously enslavement of Africans by other Africans. And the dominant pattern in the Indian Ocean, particularly the western portion of the Indian Ocean, was an enormous slave trade out of East Africa conducted by essentially Arabs, with one of the major uh, entrepots being Zanzibar. You then go further east. You have massive uh, Islamic slave raiding into India, um, uh, for example, the Ghaznavids in the 10th and 11th century. You have places in Central Asia like Bukhara, Kiva, Samarkand, Tashkent, major slave markets into the late 19th century. So the idea that slavery was something only done by Westerners is rubbish, just as the idea that imperialism was only something done by Westerners is rubbish. I mean, obviously, one of the greatest of imperial powers throughout history has been China. And the idea that imperialism is a Western construction would be laughable if you were somebody who's lived or whose forebears lived in Tibet or in what we would now call, they didn't call it in the past, Vietnam or Mongolia or Sinkien. So, you know, you've had massive empires that are non-Western. You've had important slave societies that are non-Western. But at the present moment, because for some reason people can't contextualise that, they think of this as just being only Western. You ask about the racial component. Um, in slave systems, you have often people from other societies of a different colour who are slaves, but you also have people who are of the same colour, whatever you mean by colour, who are slaves as well. So, for example, if you'd gone to a Roman galley, you would have found that much of the crew looked pretty similar to the soldiers on the, on the warship. 
Um, so you shouldn't, in Africa, um, you know, the people who enslaved others and then sold them to, to Arabs or to, uh, to Europeans were obviously fellow Africans. And you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, in your article villages being raised, all, all the uh, fit men being taken and basically everybody else wiped out. And this was occurring throughout Africa. And I, as I said, Viscount Palmerston claimed that half the evil was done before anybody ever set foot on a slave ship. But just quickly before we finish up, Jeremy, Freetown, uh, what was it like for the uh, African-American slaves or of the African slaves who, who wound up as free people in Freetown? Well, it wasn't marvellous because, you know, obviously it was the tropics, you've got disease, but it was a hell of a lot better than being on a slave ship and it was a hell of a lot bit better than being in the plantations. But one last point, if you go to South Sudan, Sudan, nor the northern part of Nigeria at the moment, you would find slavery existing at the present day. Wow. The idea that slavery is simply a construction by Westerners, simply a way in which people who are black are oppressed by people who are white is complete rubbish.